So in this um, session, we'll move to the emotional balance part of this uh, two-day retreat. So remember, with emotional balance, <coughs> um, we're talking about being fully present with our experiences and not either reacting to our experiences with attachment or aversion or suppressing or just simply shutting down. And so as part of that cultivating that emotional balance, today I'd like to look at the loving-kindness practice and in particular then how to deal with attachment which is one way that we react and we're emotionally imbalanced. Loving kindness is a um, translation of the Sanskrit word Maitri and the Pali word Metta. And both of those words uh, are defined as simply the wish for ourselves and others to be happy. Or more precisely, the wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. So what we notice from that definition is that Maitri and Metta, it, which here we're translating as loving kindness, is not an emotion. Because sometimes Maitri and Metta is translated as love, but I think that can be misleading because love in our English language is definitely an emotion and it often implies some sort of intimate behavior. Whereas here, Maitri and Metta are not an emotion, they're an aspiration, they're a wish. It's an aspiration or wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. So I think it's better to translate them as loving kindness rather than as love. Now, of course, most of us already have a desire or wish for happiness. But often our desire or wish or aspiration for happiness is misdirected. <coughs> meaning that not only don't we really find that happiness, but often in the process we induce a lot of unnecessary suffering. And this is uh, very nicely summarized by great Indian master Shanti Deva, who says, those desiring to escape from suffering hasten right toward their own misery. And with the very desire for happiness, out of delusion, they destroy their own well-being as if it were the enemy. So if we want to cultivate loving kindness for ourselves and others, a wish for ourselves and others to have happiness and its causes, then we need to know what is happiness, what do we mean by happiness, what are the causes of that happiness, and how do we cultivate those causes. Because if we don't know those three things, then loving kindness, this wish for ourselves and others to be happy, is just words which have no meaning. So therefore, let's have a look at what do we mean by happiness? What are the causes of that happiness and how do we cultivate those causes? The first type of happiness is called temporal happiness, which is another name for uh, pleasure, our pleasurable experiences. So this, of course, is a what's called a stimulus-based happiness. 
that we receive some sort of stimulus and we have a pleasant experience. And, and therefore, often this is called conditioned happiness. That we need some sort of conditions to come together for us to have that happiness experience. And therefore, by its nature, it is unstable. Because when the stimulus finishes, the pleasant experience finishes. And it's also, by its nature, unreliable. Because we can't just have a pleasant experience whenever we want one. It requires certain conditions to come together. If there's no conditions, no stimulus, there's no pleasant experience. So it's unreliable. But also, if we look at our pleasant experiences very closely, we can come to appreciate that our pleasant experiences are not even really in the nature of happiness. Because if our pleasant experiences were in the nature of happiness, it would mean the more that we engaged in our pleasant experiences, the more happy we should become. But we know from our own experience that often if we overindulge in our pleasant experiences, not only don't we become more happy, but often we induce a lot of unnecessary suffering. Classic example, of course, is eating too much of our favorite dessert or spending too long out in the nice warm sunshine. Overindulging in these pleasant experiences often leads to suffering. So therefore, what we can understand is these pleasant experiences are simply relative experiences. Relative to some previous state, they're an improvement, but if we overindulge in them, they themselves can turn into suffering. So that is the first type of happiness, temporal happiness or conditioned happiness. The second type of happiness is called is genuine happiness, this state of inner well-being. This happiness is not a stimulus-based happiness. It doesn't require any particular stimulus for to be in that state. So therefore, it's often called unconditioned happiness. We don't need certain conditions to be present for us to have genuine happiness. So therefore, because it's unconditioned happiness, therefore it is stable, reliable, and in the nature of happiness. So when we talk about cultivating loving kindness for ourselves and others, the wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes, we're mainly talking, of course, about genuine happiness. But what we need to realize is that it's not a choice. It's not like either I strive for genuine happiness or I strive for pleasure. It's not a choice. But sometimes that's what we understand. Because often when this idea is presented in Buddhism, together with this we have what's presented a term called renunciation, that to develop the aspiration for genuine happiness, we develop this state of mind called renunciation. And usually this is explained as renunciation means to give up what's called the eight worldly concerns. And the eight worldly concerns are four pairs of things. One we're trying to get and the other one we're trying to push away. Because we tend to feel as if the source of my happiness and the source of my suffering is out there. So then in terms of 
finding happiness, we tend to feel as if it's critical to be happy, we need more stuff. We need more money, more wealth, more possessions. So the first pair is gain and loss. Gain meaning material gain, that we feel like that the more money and pl uh, possessions we have, material possessions, the more happy we're going to be. And we feel as if we don't have that, we lose those, that's going to be the source of suffering. So we put a lot of energy in trying to accumulate money and possessions, and we put a lot of energy in trying to avoid losing them. Also, we tend to equate pleasurable experiences with happiness. So we feel like, if I want to be happy, I need more pleasure. So we put a lot of time and energy in trying to have these pleasurable experiences. Because we feel the more pleasurable experiences, the more happy I'm going to be. And also we tend to equate unpleasant, painful experiences with suffering. And we feel uh, we try to avoid any uh, unpleasant, painful experiences. But not only do we feel like it's important for our happiness that we have a lot of pleasure and a lot of stuff, but we often feel like it's important for our happiness what people are saying about us. So the third pair is praise and blame. So again, we tend to put a lot of effort into uh, ensuring that others are praising us and we try to avoid any situations where people are blaming us for things because we feel like praise is a source of happiness, blame is a source of suffering. But not only do we feel like it's important for our happiness what people are saying about us, but also that it's important for our happiness what people are thinking about us. So the fourth pair is good and bad reputation. So we put a lot of time and energy in trying to get a good reputation that people are respecting us, uh, admiring us, looking up to us. And we feel like if we have a bad reputation, we're going to suffer. So we put a lot of energy trying to avoid that. So we put a lot of energy trying to get the things on the left because they seem to be the source of happiness and we try to avoid the things on the right because they seem to be the source of suffering. But here in Buddhism, when we see this word renunciation, we're talking about renouncing or giving up the eight worldly concerns. But then often people think this means I have to give up Money, wealth, material things, I have to give up pleasure, praise and good reputation. Because it's not right or good to have wealth, pleasure and so forth as a good Buddhist. Uh, this is a, a completely mistaken. Renunciation is not saying give up the eight worldly things. It's talking about giving up eight worldly concerns. The word concern here... Concern means uh, thinking that these are the source of happiness and that these are the source of suffering. So what renunciation is really saying, because it, whether or not we have wealth, possessions, pleasure, that's not the important thing. The important thing is our attitude towards them. So renunciation is saying give up an unhealthy attitude to these things. Or in other words, give up attachment and craving for the things on the left and give up aversion to the things on the right because attachment and aversion to these things is only producing suffering. And so this word renunciation actually is a classic example of how terminology can create a lot of confusion because actually this is not a very good translation. The original Sanskrit word here 
is nisrana. Ni, the prefix ni means to move, is, means out of, away from. Sarana means to move, to go. So ni sarana means to move out of, to move away from. So what it really means is the aspiration to move away from, to move out of suffering to, to liberation. So this is the aspiration for liberation from suffering. The word renunciation doesn't really have that meaning. So actually it's not a very good translation. But someone decided early on, many years ago, that it was, and it sort of stuck. So whenever you see the word renunciation, what we are to understand is that what this really means is the aspiration for liberation from suffering. Yeah. Nisarana, ni means out of, away from, and sarana means to move, to go. So we're talking about moving away from or moving out of, going out of, suffering towards liberation. So this is really the aspiration for liberation. And the Tibetan word, also uh, from the Sanskrit, Tibetan, the Tibetan written language was designed for Buddhism. There was no written language when Buddhism came to Tibet, so they developed a written language for Buddhism. So the Tibetan terms also uh, tend to be very precise. The Tibetan word for this is ne chung. Ne means certain or definite. Chung means to emerge. So it means to definitely emerge from suffering to liberation. So both the Sanskrit and Tibetan word, very precise in meaning, this not. So this is uh, important. When we see the word renunciation, and that's what often people feel, like that's presented in this context, and then people go, I don't want to be a Buddhist because I don't want to give up my money and pleasure and praise and so forth. But what renunciation is saying is to give up the, the unhealthy attitude to them. Attachment and aversion. That's what it's saying. But even that is not a, a very good translation of the original word. You know, Glenn, we talked about it. I see a few new people here and we translate a bit. You can see it in the Toshita uh, thing that she has. In Hebrew, it was also a problem. And we called it Hanechishut Lechaletz Vechaletzut Vada'i To Hanechishut Lishtachrer Veshichur Vada'i Lo Mishtamshim Bamila Vitur Renunciation So we translated it as In the Tibetan way Yeah, no, it's important, you know Yeah, yeah, yeah Yeah, so that's what I often tend to do When we come across important terms particularly when it's not a good translation. And sometimes it's, it is a good translation, but it's just that there is no word in English that has the same meaning. So the translator is forced to pick a word that sort of approximates the original word, but often that word in English has other meanings as well. So I always tend to go back to the Sanskrit and really define exactly what the word means. Okay, so therefore, when we see this presentation of genuine happiness in Buddhism, Together with that, we often see this idea of renunciation. And what it really means is the aspiration to be liberated from suffering, to strive for this goal of genuine happiness, for liberation. So what we can see here then is it's not a choice. It's not like if we're striving for genuine happiness, we have to give up uh, our pleasurable experiences. But what we will do is because we'll understand that this inner well-being is within ourselves. It's not out there to be found. So we'll turn our attention from looking out there to look inside. Which means then we won't have this attachment to these, hoping that they're going to give us genuine happiness, and won't have aversion to these, thinking they're the source of suffering. So therefore, with this shift, you'll find actually when you strive for genuine happiness, you'll actually enjoy your pleasurable experiences much more than you do now because you will understand them for what they are. They're simply temporary, transient, pleasant experiences and if they're there, we enjoy them. If they're not, no big deal. 
So that's something important here. Um, any questions about the two types of happiness? So again, what we tend to do now is we tend to conflate these two and we tend to hope or want this to give us this. And so what we end up with, of course, is we end up with craving an attachment for this, trying to hold on to it, hoping that it's going to give us this. Which means, of course, if we end up with craving an attachment to pleasant experiences, then together with that, of course, comes worry and anxiety about not getting it, not getting enough of it, losing it. And then, of course, together with that comes frustration when we don't get it. Together with that comes usually overindulgence when we do get it and thereby more suffering. And then, of course, when these pleasurable experiences finish, we often end up with dissatisfaction and disappointment because they didn't live up to our expectations. And then what happens, of course, is that we feel the problem is we just didn't get enough of it. That's the problem. So we end up with more craving. And then that craving and attachment then looks at that thing that we've had some pleasure in and then at some point craving and attachment goes, sorry, that's not good enough anymore because I need something bigger, better and different. So craving and attachment is never satisfied, which means we actually stop enjoying the things we used to enjoy because craving and attachment now says, that's not good enough anymore. I need something bigger, better and different. <laughs> it is when we realize it. It's not when we're caught up in it. Because <laughs> we're just suffering. And on that note, um, if we can, again, if we can develop this renunciation or nisa and this aspiration for genuine happiness, um, then we will reduce and eliminate our craving and attachment for these. And we will enjoy our pleasurable experiences much more than we do now. And I'd just like to relate an experience uh, from my own personal experience on this point. Many years ago when I f did my first long meditation retreat, I was in Spain in a retreat center, side of a mountain, I uh, had a nice little retreat cabin, nice view, and the retreat center were providing meals every day in a little basket. They'd deliver the basket to near my hut. I'd collect it and have the food. And the, the food was quite nutritious, but it tended to be quite repetitive. And we know from our own experience that even if it's something we really like to eat, but we eat it again and again and again, it doesn't take too many times of eating the same food before we go, oh, not that again. But my experience in the retreat was exact opposite. That after a month of eating this similar food, it, ta it started tasting better. And I, initially I was convinced that the cook was putting more effort into the cooking. Maybe they were adding some more spices or herbs or something. But then a few more weeks went by and it kept tasting better and better and better. And then after about six or seven weeks, I realized this is exactly the same food as six weeks ago. What's changed? What had changed was that due to being in meditation retreat, the mind calming down, particularly mindfulness improving, um, my craving and attachment was subsiding, which meant that I was actually more in the experience itself and I was really appreciating the, the taste of the food. So I was actually enjoying that food like I've never enjoyed food before. And also I was in a cabin that had a nice big spacious view in the distance, the Mediterranean, beautiful view. But again, if we're in a place with a beautiful view day after day after day, it doesn't take too many days of being there. We don't even notice the view anymore. But my experience was the view kept getting more and more beautiful. And then even little insignificant things like tiny little flowers were suddenly, wow, that's amazing, that's so beautiful. 
and again, it's the same reason, is that due to craving and attachment subsiding, particularly through better mindfulness, I was enjoying this much, much more. So, therefore, if we can reduce that craving and attachment through mindfulness plus through understanding the source of happiness is within ourselves, then I think you'll find that you will enjoy your simple pleasures in life much, much more than you do now. So this is when we talk about love and kindness, Maitreya Metta, the wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. We're mainly, of course, talking about genuine happiness, inner well-being. What are the causes of genuine happiness? Because even if we appreciate we're talk what this inner well-being is, if we don't know what the causes are, again, just wishing that has no meaning. Because if we wish for something that we have no way of knowing how to attain it, then it's, that wish is just mere words. It has no meaning. So what are the causes of genuine happiness? And I think we saw this actually this morning in the first session, that in all Buddhist traditions, there are three core practices, three main causes for genuine happiness. Ethics, concentration, wisdom. So concentration, of course, is single-point concentration, often called shamatha practice. And the wisdom practice, of course, is the wisdom realizing the nature of reality, often in Sanskrit called vipassana. And particularly here, I think to really be able to fully cultivate loving kindness, we need to understand this. We need to understand that the root cause of our suffering is our mental afflictions, like attachment, anger, jealousy, and that all of these mental afflictions come from a distorted view of reality. That it's our grasping onto an independent me, an independent objective world, believing that there is an independent me here, independent objective world, that leads to attachment to pleasant things, aversion to unpleasant things, and all the suffering comes from that. If we can understand this, and together with that, understand that this distorted view is something that we can eliminate by coming to realize the nature of reality, to come to realize nothing exists independently, this idea called emptiness. If we can realize that everything is interdependent, nothing exists independently, we can overcome this distorted view, thereby overcome all of our mental afflictions and then find that genuine happiness. So if we can really appreciate this and understand that we can realize the nature of reality through the Vipassana practice, then loving kindness has some meaning because we understand what is happiness, what are the causes of happiness, and we understand how to cultivate those causes, that we can actually achieve that genuine happiness. So if we can understand these things, then loving kindness is not just some nice feeling that we have about ourselves and others. It actually is an aspiration, a wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes, has some meaning. And then, of course, that loving kindness for ourselves and others will translate into us striving to cultivate those causes and it will result, hopefully, in us helping others to uh, engage in those causes as well. So this is what we... Uh, 
mean about loving kindness, Maitri or Metta? Any questions so far? means it's very difficult to, to practice the loving kindness before you have the level of, of the wisdom for what you say. What it means, what it doesn't mean is that we have to have realization of reality before we can develop loving kindness, no. But what it does mean is that we at least need to have some intellectual understanding of this and these concepts. Because otherwise, if we say, my eye and others have happiness in its causes. What do we mean by happiness? And generally, unless we've thought about it, we're really talking about this. You know, may I and others have lots of pleasure. I think that's not so helpful because if you have that aspiration, what will come with that is craving and attachment. And of course, the flip side, what will come with that is aversion to unpleasant. So actually, having not understanding this and trying to develop loving kindness probably will translate into simply more craving and attachment for pleasant things, more aversion for unpleasant, therefore suffering. Um, so we need to appreciate this and we need to understand that this is possible, that we can achieve this state of inner well-being. Because sometimes people understand this concept, but then they go, well, okay, but that's impossible. You know, I can't do that. Because unfortunately, a lot of modern traditions, or a lot of modern, yeah, modern traditions, you know, we hear things like, what is the basic human nature? Is, is anger, it's craving, it's jealousy. That this is hard, they often say things like, it's hardwired into the brain. That's it. You're stuck with it. At best, you can reduce it, but you better get used to it. Because that's it. That's what you are. You're stuck with craving, jealousy, anger, that's it. Of course, Buddhism would disagree with this, um, that none of these are hardwired. Yes, they're strong habits, but they are not part of the nature of our mind. They're there because of this fundamental ignorance, this distorted view of reality, which we can overcome. So if we can appreciate that, then not only will we understand this, but we'll understand, yes, it's possible to achieve that result then this can have some sense or meaning. Um, I'd like to ask, ask a question that might be a bit complicated, but I think like, you're saying that and it's like the basis of everything that we're talking, Buddhism, and like I can really see how it applies to our lives, like probably the lives of most sure, people sure. here. But then I wonder, like, the fact that our suffering just comes from our mind, how much does it apply to people? I mean, like, for example, I was thinking of the refugees, which is sure, sure. thing here, not in sure. Israel. Sure. Like, a person that has gone through war and torture, and like maybe they've seen their family tortured. Sure, and, sure. Like, so, can you really say that the suffering just comes from, like, not being able to perceive things as they really are. So what, yeah. so what we need to understand is we can talk about causes and conditions. Yes, we can talk about the underlying cause is distorted view of reality, but then there's conditions. And conditions include other people behaving badly, uh, physically abusing us and so forth. And of course, then from their side, they are creating suffering for that person and for themselves. So we need to, otherwise there is a danger that we say, well, you know, if you're suffering, it's your fault. But that's a misunderstanding. That's a misunderstanding. And of course, what we can appreciate from this is if someone else is behaving badly towards you or anyone else, not only are they a, core, a, a condition for their suffering, but they're just creating more suffering for themselves as well. So we need to appreciate this, otherwise we can end up in this situation going, well, if you're suffering, it's your fault. I think my point is more, can the, like, a person like that, that has been through like, such horrors, can they really 
free themselves of their suffering by... What they, yeah, exactly. What they can do is... See, the thing is that um, these things here, if we have aversion to them, we magnify suffering. So if we can stop that aversion, that doesn't mean we won't have painful, unpleasant experiences. It means just that we won't magnify the suffering we experience. So if we can have this understanding, then no matter how painful or unpleasant an experience we have, at least we won't magnify the suffering we experience. At least that. So that's something we can also, uh, I think in a very general way, you know, this, this idea here is not anything particularly Buddhist. You know, I think, I think these ideas are something even generally accepted in psychology, you know. So it's not something we have to be Buddhist to appreciate. So I th Isn't the Buddhist part is more like realizing what's happening? Yeah. About. So this may be a little bit more Buddhist, but I think operating at this level that you're talking about is not particularly Buddhist. I think it's just really common sense. Yeah, I'm not talking just about this level, like the, the whole thing, realizing that things are not like inherently as, as we see them, realizing emptiness. But um, actually, at a, at a sort of a very, not simple level, but I mean, I mean, even now in science, generally accepted in science, is this idea of interdependency. You know, particularly if we're talking like quantum physics, I mean, quantum physics is this close to emptiness, uh, an idea. So, you know, we don't have to be Buddhist to, to start now, particularly in the modern world, to appreciate this idea of interdependency. You know, it's, it's quite well known in science and in, you know, so it's, it's not some esoteric idea. Not at all, not at all. Not at all what sure. Saying. What I'm asking is, like, even if, like, personally, I can see why emptiness, like, sure. I can understand why emptiness sure. is real, but I don't feel it. I'll still experience the world as I experience it. Exactly. And what I'm thinking is like can can people like like people that have like really been through horrors is just is realizing emptiness like enough for them? Like is, is that really something that okay, so they don't have to suffer anymore. Right. Like, so yeah, yeah. 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 I mean the, I mean yeah. Two, yeah, two two Yeah, yeah. Two things I want to mention there. One is that um, often, if our life is going too well, we just sort of float along and nothing really happens. And we don't particularly have a very productive, meaningful life, but we're not suffering dramatically. But we never really develop as a person. We never really have any deep happiness. It's only when we're faced with difficult situations that it forces us to reevaluate our worldview. So often we find that actually that some quite strong suffering is the catalyst for us to start thinking about these sorts of things. So that's the first point. And the second point, of course, is that when we talk about Vipassana, we're talking about gaining an insight into reality. We're not just talking about some intellectual understanding. I mean, now we may have a very good intellectual understanding of emptiness or interdependency, and our lives are miserable. In fact, we could be the smartest Buddhist scholar in the entire world and be completely miserable. Completely miserable. Because intellectual knowledge itself is not going to change anything. Intellectual knowledge is the framework to start to do something. And so what we need to do is we need to develop a calm, clear mind, and then we need to investigate the reality and come to experience how things exist. Then things shift. Then our fundamental ignorance gets eliminated, mental afflictions get eliminated, suffering gets eliminated. Unless we do this work, it's just another idea, you know? Um, there are many, you know, modern day philosophers, there are many brilliant modern day philosophers which come up with great ideas about life and, and so forth, but unfortunately, often you either have to either accept what they say or reject it. There's no way of testing their theory. You know, it sounds good, oh, okay. Well, no, I don't believe that. But they don't usually offer a way of testing their theory. 
So this is the Buddhist theory, and this is how you test it. But if you don't do the test, it's just another theory. May or may not be true, may or may not be accurate, but it's just another theory. We need to test the theory, and this is how we test the theory. So actually, what you find often is often in, in Buddhism we talk about two types of practitioner, ones who follow through faith, others who follow through reasoning. And the ones who follow through reasoning will investigate the nature of reality, meditate on it, and have a little taste of it. And then they go, okay, genuine happiness is possible. Now I'll put effort into the path. Where others in, who are followers of faith hear all this stuff from qualified teachers and they go, they're qualified, I have faith that they're saying is true, I'm going to put effort into that. And then they start. But again, the others say, well, okay, that's what you say, but I want to check it out first. I'm not going to put a lot of effort into something that's not going to work. So they put some effort into this, they get a little taste of it, and they go, oh, okay, this may be true. And then they go for the practice. Okay. So in terms of practicing this loving kindness, it's recommended we do it in stages. And in the text, generally four stages are mentioned. That first we cultivate loving kindness to our friends because it's most easy. Once we're comfortable with that, we expand that out to include people we don't know very well, the so-called strangers. Once we're comfortable with that, we start to expand that out to people, the so-called difficult people, the so-called enemies. And then eventually we expand that out to all living beings. So the, usually these are the four stages that are mentioned. But I think in our modern society... Uh, yeah, so in our modern society, we need to add one more step at the very beginning for ourselves. That's normally not mentioned in the text because I think historically people felt okay about themselves. I think in our modern world, we do not generally feel pretty good about ourselves. So we need to cultivate first loving kindness to ourselves then expand out to others. And so that's what we're going to do now in uh, a meditation. We're going to uh, cultivate this aspiration for ourselves and others to have happiness and its causes. Um, and we'll start with ourselves and then move out from there. And then after the meditation, I'd like to talk about attachment and how to distinguish attachment from loving kindness and then how to deal with attachment.